From Interior Alaska's most trusted news source, this is the Fairbanks Evening News. Good evening. Thank you for joining us. A federal magistrate has ordered that a 55-year-old former Fairbanks North Star Borough Assembly candidate remain in jail after he was arrested in an alleged murder-for-hire plot. During a hearing earlier today in U.S. District Court in Fairbanks, Eric Graber was read findings from a two-count federal indictment by U.S. Magistrate Judge Scott Orovec. Graber faces a maximum 20 years in jail on charges that he had someone travel from Alaska to Indianapolis on December 29th to kill someone in either Indiana or Michigan. Now, the intended victim is identified in court documents as GLC Jr., and Graber is accused of paying approximately $40,000 to have the person killed. Prosecutors also say on January 3rd, Graber made a cell phone call to make sure the plot was being carried out. Now, Graber is a licensed gun dealer and apparently operating out of his home off of China Hot Springs Road. Trial in his case is set for March 11th. Well, the Fairbanks community is still discussing President Obama's impending executive orders and pressure to Congress for tighter gun control measures. Local Second Amendment supporters say the president's calls for action are more about control than safety. No doubt video images of the Aurora, Colorado movie theater shooting or the recent tragedy at Sandy Hook Elementary in Newtown, Connecticut create shocking and emotional responses from those who view them. Local gun supporters say this is how anti-gun advocates and now the White House use those images and those emotions in their favor. And they aim that emotion toward the guns. The gun is bad. The gun did the bad thing. The gun isn't the one that did the bad thing. It's the guy who did the bad thing. But they are always using a disaster like this to stir up emotion and to keep the emotion up they use a term like assault rifle and they try to make that assault rifle evil there's nothing evil about an assault rifle firearm enthusiast and second amendment advocate michael dukes agrees assault weapons make up less than one half of one percent of all the firearms uh, uh, crimes that are that are perpetrated out there less than one half of one percent yet that's what you focus on that's, that blows the whole argument right there. You're really, it's really not about keeping people safe then. Really, it's about controlling what people have. Duke says he is pleased that out of the 23 orders issued, none were direct action orders, such as immediate weapons bans or absolute restrictions. He also believes the suggested legislation to Congress for assault weapons bans and per-round magazine limits will go nowhere. Duke says gun-related crime is down and has been down despite the recent mass shooting tragedies. Further restrictions on firearm ownership only affects law-abiding citizens, never the criminal. Politicians just haven't figured out that criminals, by their very definition, are going to break the law. So it doesn't matter how many new laws you pass, they are criminals, so they're going to break the law. Again, it goes back to what is it really about? Is it about safety or control? It's about control. Uh, and I think a lot of the blue dog Democrats and the pro-gun Democrats, and even those who may be on the fence on the Republican and Democratic side, are feeling the heat from their constituency. There is no real interest of that in the legislature. But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't stay vigilant. A 20-year-old Fairbanks man is dead and his 19-year-old brother seriously injured. Earlier today, after their small car rear-ended a Department of Transportation road grader along the Parks Highway near Nanana. Alaska State Troopers say Robert Gusty was the driver of a small passenger car that struck the road grader as both vehicles were traveling southbound at mile 296 off the highway. Gusty died at the scene of the accident. His passenger, 19-year-old Brad Gusty, also of Fairbanks, sustained serious but non-life-threatening injuries. That's according to Trooper spokeswoman Megan Peters. An investigation into the accident continues. It may be just a symbolic gesture, but House Speaker Mike Chenault says his gun rights bill should be discussed by the legislature. At the start of the 28th legislature, Chenault introduced legislation to make it a misdemeanor for a federal official to try to enforce certain new restrictions on gun ownership. The legislation was drafted before President Obama's announcement earlier this week, but was introduced the day of the president's press conference. Chenault says he's heard from Alaskans concerned about the federal government trampling on the right to bear arms. He said lawmakers can decide whether to advance his bill and have the courts decide its constitutionality. All right. Any plans for the weekend? Yes. Yeah. Going out to dinner. What about you? Well, I, I thought maybe inside. outside, inside, because it's going to be cold tonight. I think it's going to be cold. It was cold today. Yeah. I it felt know. pretty cold well, because it was 30 degrees above, and right. now we hit 
30 something, below. Yeah, so there's only one person to ask uh, how the weekend weather is going to be, and that's our the one and only man. Mike Schultz. Mike yeah. Schultz, tell us what's going on. You guys are right. It's going to get darn chilly tonight. 33 below with here in the interior. If you go higher up in the elevations, it's going to be warmer because, once again, we have another inversion going on. On our latest satellite picture, again, you can see lots of cloudiness <clears throat> down to the south. Here in the interior, for the most part, skies are clear. And then we're looking at uh, that pattern to continue, although some of this cloudiness might start drifting up to the north and give us some, some snow flurries tomorrow. But the key is, by Sunday, looking at temperatures warming back up again. And by uh, Martin Luther King Day, it could be in the teens above zero. So that's some good news to pass along. Stephanie, Darrell? That's good news. I'll take it. What mm -hmm. about you? Sure. Why not? Okay. <laughs> All right. When we come back, the Undersecretary of the Army vis visits... <laughs> Fairbanks. <laughs> and the governor sets criteria for oil producers to follow before any tax breaks are considered. Those stories next. Stay with us. This edition of the Fairbanks Evening News is brought to you by Northland Hearing Services. Better hearing with a human touch. Kendall Auto of Fairbanks. And by Nissan. Innovation that excites. Welcome back to the Fairbanks Evening News. Yesterday, the Undersecretary to the United States Army visited Fort Wainwright. It was his last stop on a week-long tour across the United States Army Pacific Command. Undersecretary of the United States Army Dr. Joseph Westfall addressed questions and concerns regarding the future of the United States Army and its soldiers. Federal cuts have been an issue for those in the Army, and he says that the President has the U.S. soldiers' best interest in mind. Cuts uh, across the board, for example, the president has already protected the salaries and benefits of our soldiers in this year. Uh, the, uh, he has also indicated that we will, we will protect all of our programs that address wounded warrior issues. Retention is another question the undersecretary addressed. Reenlistment opportunities are becoming harder as the Army is now setting the high standards for both current and future soldiers. It's, it is going to be harder all the way around because we have to ramp down to a force of about 490,000 on the active side uh, through 2017. So we know that we're going to get tougher on, on, on re-enlistments and uh, similarly we're going to have accessions and, and we, we still need to move new, new folks into the force. USARAC is a vital part of the U.S. Army and Dr. Westfall addressed not only its strategic opportunities but the community support it receives as well. I think one of the most important strategic elements is that training uh, opportunities that exist here. Uh, combined uh, with the Air Force and its capabilities, uh, we, you know, we, we bring this joint fight um, you know, to the very best uh, levels, the highest levels here. We think uh, the elements that are here are important to our strategy, important to our force. The training opportunities are great. Uh, the community support is incredible. It really is incredible, and in fact, today I took two of our civilian aides to the secretary with me because they reflect that, uh, that tremendous support that we get from the community here. A month after an alleged serial killer killed himself in an Anchorage jail, FBI officials in Dallas, Texas, are still seeking information from the public. Israel Keyes confessed to murdering at least eight people across the country, including 18-year-old Samantha Koenig last February. The FBI is seeking information from people who may have had contact with Keyes during his Texas travels last year. He was arrested in Texas in March after using a debit card stolen from Koenig's boyfriend. The FBI says Keyes is believed to have visited the Post Oak Cemetery in the Glen Rose area between February 12th and February 16th and would like to talk with anyone who may have had contact with Keyes during that time. Governor Sean Parnell has set a list of criteria for oil producers to go by before any tax breaks are considered. He listed them during his state of the his state of the state address earlier this week. The first of those calls for the North Slope's ma major players in Trans-Canada would have to settle on a project concept by February 15th. He said if the new goals are met, then the state can begin talking about gas tax rates at that point. North Pole Senator John Coghill said no matter what is done to cut energy costs, it needs to get started. Uh, what I'd like to see uh, it, on, on any one of those is uh, how we can supply as many Alaskans as fast as possible, as cheap as possible. But for me, probably as a North Pole uh, legislator and a Fairbanks legislator, uh, having that trucking gas, uh, trying to kickstart a private industry uh, that would bring both propane and natural gas down liquefied uh, would have a huge impact. 
An Alaska Airlines flight from Kona, Hawaii to Seattle needed to be escorted to SeaTac Airport by military jets after a caller claimed a possible hijacker was aboard. Alaska Flight 819 landed in Seattle shortly after 7 p.m. Thursday evening, and FBI officials quickly detained a man in question and questioned him over two hours. The man was cooperative, and FBI officials say there was no imminent threat to the plane or the safety of the passengers. The detained passenger was not identified, and FBI officials said the agency was not anticipating an arrest in the case. The agency declined to provide information regarding the caller, however, but did say that it is a crime to make a false statement to FBI officials. Well, it's Friday. I don't see Joe, I don't but see I heard Joe somebody anywhere. is coming to host the sport. That's right. Joe's on assignment at the Carlson Center right now getting smacked up by some wrestlers or something like yeah. that. So he asked uh, Scoop <laughs> Clark to fill in and Scoop will do that right after the break. Brought to you by the Law Office of Rita T. Alley. Peace of mind through professional legal services. Hello, Interior Alaska. Scoop Clark here on a fabulous Friday in the sports seat, bringing you some interior sports action. Let's get started. The West Valley High School basketball team split a pair of non-conference games against the Valdez Buccaneers on Thursday night. Now the Class 4A defending state runner-up Wolfpack ladies finding out life without injured star point guard Hannah Matson is difficult indeed. They drop a 48-45 decision to the 3A Lady Buccaneers. Hmm. No such problems for the Valley boys though. They broke away from Valdez with a 25-9 run in the third quarter. En route to a 75-46 win, the hosts recorded 27 steals and forced 32 Valdez turnovers while committing just 12 fouls. Lorenzo Graham led the way with 23 points, I know his mom, 7 rebounds and 4 steals. Charles Sudeth and an unusual double-double with 12 points and 11 steals. Freshman Daniel Hornbuckle added 8 points, 9 assists and 3 steals for the Wolfpack. Hornbuckle says despite being the youngest on the team, he enjoys being the team leader. Yeah, I feel it like coming along. I got a lot of help from all the seniors like Lorenzo, David, Jacob, Isaac, Corey. All of them helped me out, so I'm like the young one on the team. So yeah, What have they told you? They told me just to go out there and play my game, even though I'm a freshman, just do my thing. Don't worry about the crowd. Don't worry about critics. Just go out there and play my game, and I'll be fine. So without them, I'll be, I don't know where I'll be. We got a lot of contributions out of our bench, um, and our bigs are starting to come along. I was waiting on them, and now they're coming. So that's that's, that's something that I'm, I'm really excited about because that makes us a, a deeper team and makes us more um, uh, a, a more deep and makes us able to go um, longer and faster with our press. So that's exactly what we want to do. Let's wrestle. The Dog Bowl was on the wrestling mat last night. It was senior night at Lathrop High School for the wrestling team in their last home meet of the season. They were being honored at this meet with rival West Valley. Look at that. They're so proud and, you know, good careers, all of them. A nice send off for those Malamute seniors. Wyatt Owen got things going for West Valley. Now he had a four to three decision over Jacob Smith over Lathrop at the 138 pound class. But Joe Dickinson set the tone for the Malamutes with a 17 to two tech fall over Zach Gaden at 160 pounds. Now Lathrop got the next three matches and would go on to win the meet 44-33. The ladies faced off with Cody Wareham pinning Datisha Agnew in three minutes and 47. Their video is coming up soon, I think. Lathrop's Jacob Wharton got fastest pin of the night, 22 seconds to pin Andrew Hawkins. Now there is one week left in the regular season for 4A wrestling before regionals. That will occur at the end of the month. The Natick women's basketball team were in the driver's seat last night at the Patty Center against the Central Washington Wildcats. This GNAC foe came in having, with all, having only one conference win. Now the Natick's jetted out to a 15-5 lead to begin the game. Awesome. The Wildcats would rally and go up 27-26 at the half. Not so awesome. To start the second half, Benisa Bulaya made some plays for the Natick's getting into the paint. She put the Natick's up by four. She finished with 11 points. But Central would answer with a tray ball, that's right. With about 12 minutes to go, it had been a tight-nipped game. It was tied at 42 with a Jacqueline Bartleson bucket, two of her eight points. Then the Nanooks fell asleep at the wheel, and especially on rebounding, with the Wildcats taking a 49-36 advantage on the boards, led by Jasmine Parker's 17 boards and 11 points. Jessica Van Dyke had a game-high 21 points, 14 of which was in the second half. Wildcats, 25-5 run in the last 10 minutes. They would win 69-49. Um, that's the kind of team we are. We get second boards and 
Um, we run, we get stops, and crash the boards, and that's what good teams do. So that's what really helped us tonight. I'm a leader, I'm a captain, and I said I gotta step up and I gotta make some shots and get my team going so they can um, follow. We need to start playing to win instead of playing not to lose. Bucket for bucket isn't good enough anymore. Gotta come out hot all the time, rebound, get stops, and then the shots will fall. Offense will always come, but it starts with defense. Now this is hot out, too hot off the press. The Nanooks took their momentum into South Bend to take on the number one team in the CCHA this weekend. That's right, the Fighting Irish of Notre Dame. Now, as of just a few minutes ago, Jared Granberg scored with three seconds remaining, his second goal of the game to win the five to four Nooks win. Also scoring for UAF, Garrett Perry, Nick Uremchek, and Andy Toronto. That is awesome. See if they can make it two tomorrow. Also in hockey this weekend, the Ice Dogs host the Springfield Junior Blues. Your Ice Dogs are currently on a four-game winning streak after sweeping the Janesville Jets last weekend, but the Blues have also won four straight, including a sweep of West Division leader Wenatchee. The Ice Dogs have some players in the zone, with Devin Lowe being named the West Division Player of the Week two weeks ago. Awesome. And teammate Jason Angus, last week's MVP. Steve Perry, not from Journey, but uh, nevertheless a star. And Kevin Aldridge have been walls in the net as well for the Ice Dogs. This is a matchup of two hot teams, so this has the makings of a great series, folks. And uh, that's all I got. That's all I got for sports tonight. Thanks for rocking with me, Scoop Clark, for a little while. Get more KTVF Sports on YouTube, Twitter, our new mobile app, and, of course, WebCenter11.com. Now Mike Schultz is coming up with your weekend forecast. I'm out. We'll catch you next time. Well, we got so spoiled with those warm temperatures, mm -hmm. and today, <laughs> back to 28 below for the overnight low. And mm. it hurt. Did it? It hurt. Ah. <laughs> I was feeling it today. Well, tomorrow morning, it should be very, very chilly, but after that, warming up very nicely. As I said, temperatures should be above zero by uh, Sunday. Oh, great. That's good. Yeah, 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 maybe I can get some bad. skiing in. I, not, why not? <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Let's take a look at our numbers out the airport and show you what's going on. It is starting to fall 19 degrees below zero after a high of 16 below. And as I said earlier, 28 below for the overnight low at the airport. Record high, 38, 20, 2001. Record low, 61 below, 1906. Sunrise was a 1018, sunset at 348, giving us not quite five and a half hours of daylight, a, lot, a gain of six minutes from yesterday. I always say loss, I don't know why. Anyway, Joanne Klum sent this photograph in called Goldstream Sunrise. The sun peeking through the trees there. Nice photograph, Joanne. If you have a photograph, send it to Mike Schultz at ktvf11.com. What's going on across the interior right now? Well, temperatures are starting to fall pretty good. As you can see, they've already bottomed out at, well, starting to bottom out at 20, Allison Air Force Base, 23 below. Fort Wainwright and Fairbanks at 19 below. 18 below at Delta Junction, 21 below at North Pole. Really cold at Nunana, 25 below. Even colder than Alley Park, 28 degrees below zero. Lower, actually, lower 48 we'll talk about in a little bit, but what's going on across the rest of the state? Cloudy skies over southeast Alaska, across the Gulf of Alaska. No real precipitation to talk about, except for a little bit of shower activity around the Bethel area. Other than that, clear skies at Nome, partly cloudy at uh, Barrow, and really getting cold at Fort Yukon, 33 below currently, and getting colder. Lower 48 weather, as I said before, not a whole lot to talk about, mainly just uh, clear skies west of the Rockies, to the uh, east of the Rockies, a little bit of snow shower activity around Minneapolis and some showers over the southeast all because that jet stream remains well to the north bringing that moisture across from Canada and the Great Lakes and that shows up pretty good on the jet stream for early next week and not a whole lot of change except even warmer temperatures up and down the western side of the country brutally cold air coming in from Canada across the Great Lakes cooler across the deep south. Back to Alaska for tomorrow. For the northern sections, mostly cloudy for Barrow, partly cloudy for Nome, and wind chills will be likely in the Fort Yukon area, 14 below for the high. Here in the interior, looking at clearing skies in Fairbanks, mostly cloudy with morning flurries in Healy, then more flurries moving into the Fairbanks area later on in the afternoon. Over southeast Alaska, scattered snow showers for Juneau, mixed showers for Ketchikan, and over to the southwest, we're looking at uh, windy at Cold Bay, mostly cloudy for Cody and wind chills for Bethel. And in the south central regions, not too bad. Partly cloudy for Anchorage, also partly cloudy in Homer, and mostly cloudy for Valdez. And it is a Friday night, which means it's time for our winter trails report, brought to you by the good folks at Beaver Sports. Temperatures will slowly rise through the weekend, which means all outdoor activities should be a go. Just remember to wear the right clothing. Keep that in mind. Thanks, Beaver Sports, for that 
opportunity. And also, one more time, we have air quality problems again. Fairbanks is unhealthy for sensitive groups. North Pole unhealthy until 12 noon Sunday. Not too good. Here's our forecast for tonight. 33 below at the lowest lying areas around the Fairbanks area. Clearer and warmer the higher up you go. And then tomorrow, looking for more clouds moving in with a chance of flurries by afternoon, two degrees below zero. The extended forecast calling for flurries to continue on Sunday, then cloudy skies and maybe some more showers or flurries on Monday or Tuesday. Temperatures will continue above normal and then slowly start to cool down once again by Wednesday and Thursday. And overnight lows also dropping down to about 12 below, which is still above normal for this time of year. So it's not all that bad. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sounds good to me. I'm liking it a lot, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, make sure you download the new KTBF mobile app for your iPhone, iPad, or Android smartphone. Get up-to-date local news, sports, weather, and more wherever you go. It's really cool. That's a yeah, really cool app. It is. I have it on my phone, both my phones. All right. That'll wrap up this edition of the Fairbanks Evening News. As always, we are glad you could join us. Tonight on NBC Nightly News, the latest on the hostage crisis overseas. That's next with Brian Williams. Be sure to join the news team Saturday for your only local news in the interior. From all of us here at the News Center, have a great night and a happy weekend.